Hey, good morning. I've got your next video uh, as I try to catch up from where I was sick. Uh, this one is called Colonialism and Indigenous Response in the Americas. And um, I want to first talk about the conquest of Mexico. Uh, this image here is supposed to be a picture of Hernan Cortez meeting the king, Montezuma, of the Aztecs. Now, Hernan Cortez, he invades Mexico in 1518. He only has 500 men with him. Uh, he defeats an Aztec force at the city of Tabasco uh, simply because he's got an advantage. He's got steel weapons and steel armor versus the obsidian weapons that the Aztecs have. And he's doing this completely against the law. Uh, he was ordered by the Cuban governor to stay put, not go to Mexico, and definitely not attack anybody. But he does it anyways. And Cortez is going to move very quickly because he thinks that the Cuban governor is sending an army after him to stop him. Now, after beating the Aztec force at the city of Tabasco, uh, he's given a woman named Malince as a prisoner after his victory. And she becomes a teacher to Cortez. Uh, she teaches him about Aztec culture. She becomes his interpreter. And uh, she's also able to speak several languages, too. Now, Cortez befriends an enemy of the Aztecs called the Tlaxicans. And together, the 500 or so Spanish, along with a small Tlaxican army, are going to march on the city of Tenochtitlan, which was the headquarters or the capital city of the Aztecs. Now, when he gets there, um, Cortes is going to meet Emperor Montezuma II, and we know on this date, November 2nd, 1519. And hopefully you read the, the reading where Montezuma and Cortes meets. Montezuma welcomes him as, you know, returning God, and Cortez says, thanks, we're friends now. About a week later, Cortez is going to take Montezuma prisoner, and he leaves the city. And while he's gone, he orders the remaining Spanish to massacre hundreds of Aztec nobles. And that's the story that you get with um, the musicians being killed and uh, that feast being a bloodbath. Now, Cortez will return to Tenochtitlan a couple months later. He's got about 2,000 soldiers with him. And with the help of smokebox, he's going to conquer the Aztecs by 1521. Now, the final Aztec emperor is going to be captured and seized in 1525. Now, the other really big conquistador a lot of people talk about is Francisco Pizarro. And Pizarro led an expedition to Peru in the late 1530. And he only has about 200 Spanish with him. And he's going to hear legends of these great silver mines somewhere in South America. And as he and his 200 men are marching through northern South America, they come across the Inca who were in the middle of a civil war. Uh, smallpox had come to the Inca Empire, and smallpox had just killed the emperor, and his two sons who survived were fighting over the throne. And those two sons were Atahualpa and Huscar. Uh, Pizarro meets Atahualpa right after Atahualpa has defeated his brother. Atahualpa is going to be captured by Pizarro, and that paralyzes the entire empire. Uh, the way the Inca Empire was set up, it was completely top-down. Basically, if you chop off the head, nobody knew what to do after that. <clears throat> now, Atahualpa is going to attempt to make a deal for his life. Uh, Atahualpa tells Pizarro, I can get you an entire room full of gold, and if you do that, please let me go. And Pizarro says, yeah, uh, if you can get me an entire room full to the top of gold and silver, I'll let you go. So Atahualpa put out commands to his followers. Gold and silver started to show up. A room was filled. Pizarro took the gold and silver, and then he took Atahualpa's life and went against his own deal. And Atahualpa is going to be executed 
uh, July 26th of 1533. Now, after having Atahualpa killed, Pizarro is going to invade the capital city, Cusco, and he's going to basically declare himself the new emperor and takes control of the empire from the top. Now, why were both of these conquistadors successful? I can really just put it down to four reasons that are easy to understand. Number one, take out the top. If there's a power pyramid and you take out that top rank, then the rest of the power pyramid has no idea what to do. So both Cortez and Pizarro took out the top power and inserted themselves and became that top power. Both Pizarro and Cortez found outside enemies and used them. The Inca had a lot of enemies. The Aztecs had a lot of enemies. The enemy of my enemy is my friend sort of thing. European diseases. Both the Aztecs and the Inca suffered from smallpox, which weakened their numbers, lessened their numbers, and made them easier to defeat. And then last but not least, just weapons. The Inca had obsidian and... The Aztecs had obsidian, the Spanish had guns, and iron, and horses, and there was just no chance for either the Aztec or the Inca. So what happens after the Europeans take over both of these empires? They start to establish colonies. Um, there's going to be a bureaucracy that's established, and the Europeans are going to take complete control of these local governments. And in many cases, the government that they create looks just like the government they just destroyed. Uh, there's going to be some sort of governor. There's going to be some autonomy for the locals. And all the labor assignments, such as the Miata system, are just going to continue. There's not going to be a lot of change. Eventually, these colonies are going to be more about raising money than they are actually governing and doing a good job. Uh, there's a lot of wars in Europe, and they need to, to raise money. And this money was very often raised by selling government positions to the uh, American-born Spaniards, known as Creoles. So, basically, the government positions are going to be sold to the highest bidder. And the highest bidder is not always going to be the best leader. And there's going to be this steady decline in the quality of administrators because, well, quite simply, profits are going to be put before ability. Uh, North American colonies... I'm not going to go too far into this because you've probably had or you're familiar with U.S. history. But settlement in North America really didn't begin until the 1600s with places like Jamestown, Quebec, Plymouth. And they're both for profit and religious freedom. So there's two different reasons why these are going to happen. And there's going to be this real love-hate relationship that's developed between Europeans and native populations. Um, native Americans originally help European settlers especially here in North America, but it's going to turn into competition. And very often the indigenous people are going to be on the losing end of that competition. All right, the last part of this lecture is about the Columbian Exchange. And the Columbian Exchange, it's a term that's developed by a historian named Alfred Crosby, and it describes the intentional and unintentional transfer of biological materials between Europe and the Americas. And it happens in a couple of different categories. Different foods, different sugars, uh, drinks, diseases, and even people. Now this chart here is a very good summary, or this uh, graphic, I should say. It's a very good summary. Uh, some of the most important foods that are going to come over to Europe from the New World are the potato, the tomato, uh, fish from the coast of Canada, and corn. Corn is definitely the most important of these. Uh, the sugar trade. Sugar was especially prized for high profits. Uh, the main center of sugar plantations is going to be Brazil, but it's also going to become very important in the Caribbean and the island of Hispaniola. And sugar from the New World starts to flood into Europe right as the production of honey from honeybees starts to decline. Uh, sugar becomes so important that the Dutch are going to give up New York, or New Amsterdam as it was known then, for sugar plantations in South America. <clears throat> Drinks such as tea and coffee 
while they're not originally from the New World, tea plants and coffee plants are taken to the New World where it's found that they grow very well in Central and South America and huge coffee and tea plantations are created. <clears throat> Chocolate was a medicinal drink originally from Central America and it's brought to the New World where people fall in love with it and today you know, chocolate is a staple of our society. There are even some cooking techniques. Barbecue is a cooking technique that was used by a group of native indigenous people on the island of Hispaniola. And then um, African slaves are going to bring to the Caribbean the idea of frying foods such as chicken. <clears throat> Now, the Columbia Exchange is going to also involve some negative things, disease. Um, coming to the New World from the European continent are diseases like smallpox, influenza, measles, mumps, rubella, um, pneumonia, pretty much anything that we take for granted today hadn't been seen in North or South America. And in some cases, those diseases ended up having a 90% mortality rate, meaning nine out of every 10 indigenous Americans ended up dying from this. And then last but not least, people. It's not just Europeans coming to the new world. It's a lot of slaves. As these plantations get larger and larger and larger, whether it be a sugar plantation, a tea plantation, coffee plantation, even tobacco plantations, a workforce is needed for it. Originally, Europeans will use local indigenous people, but as those people die out from diseases, African slaves are going to be brought over to replace them. <clears throat> By the time the African slave trade is over, somewhere north of 12 to 15 million people are forcibly removed from Africa and sold into bondage in North and South America. All right, less than 15 minutes to get you through the nuts and bolts of this lecture. As always, if you have any questions or anything, just send me an email. I'll be glad to help you out, and I look forward to the next one. Thanks for watching.